Well, I thought I had it all. A wonderful husband, a cozy cottage in the countryside, good health, uh, financial ease, a nice job as an independent consultant, and even a beautiful one-year-old baby boy. And then one day, I got up, ready to go to yet another client, and I just collapsed. I collapsed into the sofa, and I started to cry, and I could not stop anymore. Nobody understood. I didn't understand, my husband didn't understand, the doctor didn't understand. So what was wrong with me? I started searching. I got a lot of advice. Drink bedtime tea, do yoga, do breathing exercises, take sleeping pills, and do psychotherapy. Well, I tried almost everything. But it didn't help. One and a half years earlier, I was five months pregnant. On a Friday, my husband told me that he had lost his job. And from that moment on, I started suffering from insomnia. After yet another sleepless night, I was desperate. There were days where I could hardly do more than just lie in a chair. And I had my baby boy. How could I give him all the attention and the love that I wanted to give him? Now, he is a wonderful young man of 24 years old, and it's very touching for me that he's here with us. Hello, Kirsten. <laughs> So, I was completely exhausted and burnt out, and nothing seemed to help. The doctor told me, just let your baby cry. He's big enough, he's three months old now, he can cry through the night and then you will sleep. So, was that going to make it better? No, that just made it worse again, because now my husband and I would be lying in bed completely stressed out, desperately listening to our baby desperately crying. So there seemed to be no solution. I kept on searching. And in the end, I did find something. In the meantime, we were blessed with our beautiful daughter, Lara, but we did not let her cry. Six years, it took me four years actually to get back on my feet again after that day I collapsed. And six years after the day I collapsed, my first book was published. And I'm so happy to say that last year it saw its 25th printing. Four more books were to follow, published in several languages. And there are now 70 therapists assisting those that need more help than the books can offer. So I can't say how grateful and humbled I am to see that my suffering bore fruit and has been of help to so many. Now, what did I, what did I find? I kept on searching, and the first thing that I found, actually, was that I was sure not the only one suffering. The World Health Organization research shows that in the last year, approximately 30% of all Europeans will have been suffering from mental, emotional disease. 30, almost 30%. That's not counting people over 65. If we would add those, and we would add people suffering from burnout, I imagine the figures would approach more or less 50%. And that's not counting all the people suffering from physical disease. So that's enormous. What is going on? We have all these research institutions, state of the art. We are putting billions of dollars into them. More research. We have all the medical help, all the evidence-based psychotherapies all the wise men and women and their wise books. But still, we are so sick. What's going on? I kept on searching, and my second discovery was that the mental and emotional suffering, but also the physical diseases, are linked directly to childhood suffering. 
And a very big discovery for me was that even what we call a so-called normal childhood carries trauma for a small child. It's imprinted in our brains and in our bodies. It's normal, it's so prevalent. We all carry old pain, pain from our childhood. Just imagine being a small baby, being completely dependent on your caregivers who are not fulfilling your needs, and there's no way that you can tell them you also can't get out of the situation and go elsewhere to get your needs fulfilled. You can't fulfill your own needs. And the worst of all, you have no time perspective, making the experience feel as if it will be like that forever. This makes the experience that we might think is normal, letting a baby cry, or yelling at a child, being irritated with a child. These normal things, they actually give a small child overwhelming pain. And this is something we all carry in our system. So, small children are completely at the mercy of their parents, no matter how much parents usually love their child, like my parents did, and like I did. Well, Dr. Gabor Matei, the retired physician with whom I'm happy to collaborate and who states that we do not need a stitch more research. It's that simple. There is an overwhelming body of research showing that early pain is at the basis of mental, emotional, and physical suffering. However, it seems that many um, healthcare professionals have an emotional block against this information. Because opening up would mean having to confront the childhood pain, trauma, and suffering of their patients as well as their own. So, what can we do if we all carry trauma then where, where is it? Well, it's neatly stored in our emotional brain. It's all up there. And is that then the real solution, to just go back and feel all this old pain? No, I don't think that that's the real solution. And that brings me maybe to my most important, the third discovery, is that life in the first few years programs each one of us. And it's like putting on a pair of glasses, and from that moment on, we will perceive the present the way it was when we were very small children, and not the way it is now. So imagine, if I grew up in a family with violence and hostility, I will see and expect to see a violent and hostile world, even if it's not there. Now, this is important, even if it's not there. I will be seeing through these glasses. So, if my neighbor doesn't greet me in the morning, it might well become an unintentionally hostile act. He doesn't like me and he wants to show me. Or, if as a child, I grew up in a family where I was neglected or maybe even abandoned. I will grow up to be an adult who will see a cold and indifferent world not caring for me. And no matter how much love there might be around me, somewhere inside I will keep on feeling that something is missing. We all know the tragic story of Robin Williams loved by everybody, but feeling so alone inside that he had to take his own life. So we see what we expect to see, even if it's not there, and we will react to what we perceive, and in that way we will install a vicious circle. So without knowing it, 
we keep on seeing the world and reacting to it the way it was when we were very small children. And that's what makes us sick. So, real, true healing is not just about feeling old pain, but it's about discovering that we are wearing these glasses and taking them off so that we can stop reacting as if we are in the past. Now, I can talk about PRI, past reality integration, <laughs> the method I created. I can talk about it forever, but I think the best way to explain it to you is to give you a first-hand experience. So, let's give it a try. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, so please, if you would, close your eyes. Take a few deep breaths. And then go back today or yesterday and search for just some normal situation but that was somehow unpleasant for you. And once you found this normal situation, yet unpleasant, please raise your hand. Okay, wonderful. Then zoom in on this situation and try to find the detail of the situation which was most unpleasant for you. Usually it's something that you see or something that you hear, so it could be a tone of voice, it could be particular words, maybe it's a look, maybe it's a gesture. Try to scan the situation or the person and see the detail which is most upsetting to you. And once you've found it, please raise your hand. Okay. Then, Zoom in even further on this detail. Imagine the detail becoming bigger and bigger, while at the same time you imagine yourself, your body, becoming smaller and smaller. And then ask yourself the question, which message do I feel coming towards me from this detail? So now this is not about the present, this is not about your rational mind, allow your emotions to speak. So exaggerate, make it worse, make it bigger, and put it in the words of a small child. For example, what are you doing here? Or I can't stand you, or get out of here. So try to feel inside, only you can feel what is the message that seems to be coming towards me from this detail. And please raise your hands once you found the message. Okay, and then lastly, ask yourself, what was my reaction in the situation? Did I start to become anxious? Did I start to feel inferior? Did I start to become irritated, angry, or judgmental? Did I start becoming stressed and trying to please the other person? Or did I just shrug it off as if it was not important? And then please, once you've found your reaction, open your eyes and come back. Okay, and then when you open your eyes, please take a few deep breaths to be back here. So now you have a small taste of what your glasses look like. First of all, the normal yet unpleasant daily situation somehow reflects something about your repressed and denied pain from your childhood which activated your defenses in order not to feel that repressed pain that's stored in your emotional brain. The message that you felt coming towards you echoes something about the way that you were treated as a small child. And your reaction 
shows you which defense mode was activated. Actually, it's like a survival mode that you go into without knowing it. And once we're in survival mode, we will see the present the way it was when we were very small children. So knowing these five defenses and how and why they are activated by a normal everyday situation, and then knowing that behind these defenses actually is pain that you needed to repress as a small child, because remember, the pain of the small child we were was overwhelming. Knowing all of this then enables you to come back into the present as the adult you are, instead of living in the past in the survival mode of the small child you were. So, PRI can give you the concrete tools to do this. Now, I'd like to share a few examples with you of how this works out in daily life. People that recognize their glasses were able to take them off and access the pain and come back into the present. One of my clients was a woman who had been suffering from a phobia of driving for 20 years. We found out that what her fear was really about was being hit from the back by another car. Then we found out that as a small child, two-year-old child, she would be sitting, playing on the floor, and her father, frustrated and angry because he had lost his job, sometimes would come up from the back and actually kick her while she was sitting there playing. Her mother, in the kitchen, too afraid of her aggressive husband, wouldn't do anything and just left the child. Now imagine the link between her fear and her old pain was so direct. I mean, it's an exact link. Now this woman drives around everywhere happily, even after her worst nightmare came true, and she was hit by a truck, imagine, from behind. She managed to stay calm throughout the whole ordeal, and no fear came back. Another example is that of a 65-year-old man who had been taking a cocktail of different antidepressants for 15 years because he was unable to connect emotionally to others. He was feeling no joy, he was feeling numbed, and especially with his children, he was not able to have a good relationship. He found out that, as a child, emotional connection was really lacking. Because, first of all, his mother died when he was only six, then his father started struggling with alcoholism, then he was dumped with an aunt who felt obliged to take care of him, but who didn't really want to. And now he is able to live without pills completely. He is able to feel joy again, and he is able to connect to his children emotionally and to others in general. And standing here in front of you is a woman who used to suffer from a fear of speaking in public that was enormous. I would have rather died than stand here tonight. I discovered that behind my fear was childhood rejection, and now public speaking is part of my life. So, during my burnout, I was not suffering from some mysterious physical disease, nor from some chemical imbalance in my brain, nor from some genetic predisposition. What had happened was that my husband, losing his job, had actually touched upon old pain of the small and helpless child that I was, without me realizing it. And my baby's crying had awakened directly the old pain of myself crying as a small baby. So the two events, without me realizing it, had touched my own old trauma from the child I was, activating my defenses, putting me in survival mode, and thus in total stress. Now, what would have happened if back then I would have met someone who would have said, you know, Ingeborg, what, what's happening? What do you perceive when, now that your husband is out of work? 
And what do you perceive when you hear your baby crying? Ingeborg, do you know that there is a direct link between your perception and something that you experienced as a small child, putting you into survival mode and thus in total stress? And that's the reason why you can't sleep. And something can be done about that. If I would have known that those two events had put me in survival mode, perceiving the present through the glasses of my childhood, how much suffering, how much disconnection from myself and others with such vast consequences could have been prevented. Now, you can do this. You can take off your glasses. You can get out of survival mode. You can live in the present and authentically connect to yourself and to others. Imagine the difference this could make for the world that we live in. Thank you very much.